In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. There are two aspects to our Lord's passion. The one is a payment of punishment for the sins of mankind, a suffering in place of all of the deviation of man's will towards sin. Whenever there is an embracing of sin or crime, a suffering must take place in order to remedy that, in order to pay the price of that. And that's why people go to prison. That's why people are punished. That's why people are even executed. Because there is a price to pay in justice for the deviation of our will towards something which is immoral or criminal. So there is that aspect about it. And he took upon himself all of the guilt and reparation that was necessary for the entire human race, for all of the sins that had been committed and would be committed in the future, even those sins, it was sufficient even for those sins which will never be committed. Now think of the history of the human race. Think of the pile of sin that has been built up upon this planet. The many, many millions of sins that are being committed as we speak. And all of that was taken upon him and given to him by his father in order that he make a sacrifice for sin. The other aspect, and which is actually the more important, is that Christ, as the new head of the human race, replaced the disobedience of Adam with the obedience to his father. And we will see both of these aspects in this sermon, the suffering and the obedience. So first we will look at the suffering. First we see the shame of the punishment of the cross. St. Paul said that the cross was, for the Jews, a stumbling block and for the Gentiles, foolishness. In the minds of the Jews, whoever died on the cross was not only dishonored, but was forever accursed. The cross was something that was proper to the Romans. The Jews themselves did not use the cross. They would use stoning to death, as St. Stephen was stoned to death. But they could not condemn anyone to death since the Romans had taken over. But they wanted him to be crucified. They did not want him to be beheaded, as St. Paul was, but crucified. And the, the call for crucifixion came from the Jewish crowd. Pilate had not thought of crucifixion. But they said, crucify him. And the reason was that they wanted to obliterate the honor of his name. So the chief priests knew exactly what they were doing in asking for his crucifixion. That is, that he would ever be accursed in the eyes of the Jews. Crucifixion for the Romans was a punishment reserved to slaves. You could not crucify a Roman citizen, and that's why St. Paul was not crucified. He was a Roman citizen. Yet Christ chose this form of death in order to draw souls to himself. Because in this death, our Lord realizes to perfection the notion of sacrifice, in which nothing is held back from God, not even our legitimate honor and self-esteem Now the cross as an instrument of punishment was invented actually by the Persians who used it 
successively, uh, and it was used successively by various peoples, including the, <coughs> the Greeks and the Romans. For, for example, the Romans crucified many slaves on the Via Appia owing to the slave rebellion of Spartacus and left their bodies to rot. In the beginning, it was a simple stake, just a pole, upon which the condemned man was fastened or impaled, actually, sometimes. Later, it took the shape of a fork, and the victim was hanged from it by the neck. Then the cross assumed a traverse arm, what we see today. One form was that of an X, which is St. Andrew's cross. He was crucified on an X cross. The second was in the form of a T. The third is the type of cross which we commonly see, and this is known as the Latin cross. That our Lord's cross was the third type is favored by the very early traditions. The fact that the inscription was placed above it confirms this, so that there was a piece above the T whereby the inscription was placed. That's our Lord's cross. Now, let us look at the procession to Calvary the procession was headed by a centurion, and after him was a herald who proclaimed the reason for the execution. He would carry a sign. Next came our blessed Lord in a completely weakened state. Don't forget he had been scourged and crowned with thorns, which made him lose a great deal of blood and when you lose a great deal of blood, you're in a very weak state. His original garments were placed back on him. Remember, they, they mocked him by putting the garments of a king on him and then genuflected before him. And this is why we do not genuflect at the oration for the Jews, which is coming right after this sermon, the Latinical prayers, we do not genuflect for the reason that we do not want to imitate what the persecutors of our Lord did when they mocked him for being a king. And he was surrounded by soldiers. Now the cross was about 15 feet high. We know this because our Lord said that he would be exalted. And secondly, they had to put a sponge on a lance in order to offer it to him. That means that he was hanging very high. He was not simply at eye level. The cross was high. This cross would have weighed about 200 pounds and they placed it on his shoulder. Behind our Lord were the two robbers. The crowd of Jews in Jerusalem and Jerusalem was swollen with people because of the feast day that was the Passover the Friday was the preparation for the Passover. The Saturday was the day on which the Passover was to be celebrated. So there were many people in Jerusalem. They lined the path to Golgotha and jeered at him, insulted him, and spit at him as he passed. Our Lord traveled about 3,000 feet, which is about two-thirds of a mile. And probably he fell, as the station suggests. That is not in the gospel, the three, uh, 
times that our Lord fell, but probably he did. Along the way, they constrained Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross. Cyrene was a city in northern Africa in which 25% of the population were Jews. It was common in ancient times to constrain people to do these things. It was known as the right of requisition. So the Romans had a law about it. They could do that. His sons were Alexander and Rufus. That's in the gospel. And his two sons were Christians, which suggests that Simon himself was converted. So it seems that he was first forced to do it and then later converted. But it's certain that Alexander and Rufus, his sons, were Christians. From tradition, we know that our Lord met his sorrowful mother. Our, Lord, our Lady followed him right to the end. She was with St. John and the other devoted women whom we find at the foot of the cross. Compassion is as strong as love. And we must understand that Our Lady's love for our Lord exceeded anything that we can even conceive of. And so her compassion was so deep that, as St. Bernard said, there was no suffering that came to our Lord which did not first pass through her heart. And so she suffered with our Lord in everything because there was no blockage of self-love. She was practically one person with our Lord by her love. A mother always wants a greater good for her child than the child wants for himself. And our Blessed Lady would have changed places immediately and without hesitation in order to save her son. And so we can only imagine the suffering that she went through. It's impossible even to, to get a, a proper idea of it. It was an intense and deep suffering as she watched all of this happen to our blessed Lord. And this compassion was so strong that our blessed Lord and our blessed lady, seeing each other on the way of the cross, could only speak by shedding tears, which was enough. Along the way, our Lord also meets the sorrowful women of Jerusalem. It was against the law, Roman law, for people to show compassion to someone condemned to death. The Emperor Tiberius commonly put people to death that were his enemies and let their bodies rot in the forum at Rome. And if you were to approach the body and in some way show compassion toward it or try to bury it, you would also be put to death. That was the Roman law. But they ignored the law with great bravery, for they know that our Lord is not guilty and that he is undeserving of the death penalty. It shows that despite all there were some faithful and devout souls in Jerusalem, Jews. And our Lord said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not over me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the day shall come when they shall say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that have not borne and the paps that have not given suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall upon us, and to the hills, cover us. For if in the green wood they do these things, what shall be done in the dry? And he was obviously referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Roman armies. 
in which over one million people perished, died, and many others were taken into slavery by the Romans, and the temple destroyed, and Jerusalem left in ruins. And it even came to pass that there was so much starvation in Jerusalem that people were eating their own babies. In saying this, our Lord is not rebuking them for weeping for his cause. He knows, however, that his sufferings will lead to his glory, but that this sin of the Jews will lead to terrible sufferings for them. For the Jews have a special vocation. And that is, or I should say that was, to present the Messiah to the whole world and to become his principal followers, just as the apostles were. But they betrayed that vocation and sought a different Messiah. Our Lord then arrives at Golgotha, which means the skull, and it was called that because it, the hill looked like a skull. It had the shape of a skull. It is also called Mount Calvary. The execution of a criminal, according to Jewish law, could not take place within the walls of the city, and that's why it was outside of the walls of Jerusalem. At the arrival at the top of the hill, very probably the two thieves were scourged as this was the Roman custom, that they would hold the scourging until they arrived at the cross and after being scourged, they would be crucified. But our Lord was already scourged, so they did not scourge him again. But they did strip him of his garments. Our Lord is offered at this point wine mixed with bitter herbs, what is said to be gall or myrrh in the gospel. It was the common practice of the Jews to offer this to those being executed, the idea, the idea being that it would deaden the nerves, that such a mix would deaden the nerves, that they would become a little drunk in order to bear up with the pain. But he did not drink it. Then he was stripped of his garments. The Roman custom was to leave the loincloth on the stripped person. So he was not completely naked. But nonetheless, this stripping took place in front of everyone, including women which was very, very humiliating. Then, <clears throat> our Lord was crucified. As I said, the chief priests and the Pharisees chose this manner of death in order that they dishonor him completely. The Romans reserved the cross for slaves and citizens could not be crucified. The Romans placed the cross on the ground when they were going to crucify someone and bore holes in the wood where the nails would be placed. Because obviously in, in, in such a large piece of wood, the nails would not pass very easily. Christ laid himself willingly on this altar of sacrifice. So he did not have to be forced. He did not resist in any way. But this was his altar. This was his throne. And he placed himself on it willingly. First, the right hand was affixed. The driving of the nail would have caused the precious blood to spatter in the face of the executioner.
This caused a spasmatic, spasmodic re reaction in the muscles in such a way that the left hand had to be stretched forcibly, which was extremely painful. The feet were affixed with two nails, which is usually not seen in art. But history attests to the fact that four nails were found and St. Bonaventure also mentions this in regard to the stigmata of St. Francis, that it was clear that there were four nails, two separate wounds in the feet, which St. Francis had. Our Lord resembled, therefore, the Paschal lamb, which was roasted on a spit in the form of a cross. Now, you have to understand that since this was the preparation day for the Passover, the Jewish high priests had to go to the temple and prepare the Paschal lambs for the sacrifice, the evening sacrifice. The Paschal lambs had to be, uh, to be uh, sacrificed and, and then roasted on a spit in the form of a cross and that um, commemorated the exodus where they were told to do this sacrifice and to paint the blood of the Paschal Lamb on the doorposts as a sign that the angel of death would pass over their homes. And then because of that terrible strike upon the Egyptians killing the firstborn of every Egyptian, including the animals, the Pharaoh let them go. So this was, this is actually the principal feast. And ironically, it occurs exactly today. Tomorrow is Passover for the Jews. So today is the preparation day of the, of the Passover and exactly that many years ago, this would have been happening. So there would have been a great sacrifice of all of these lambs in the temple as our Lord is hanging on the cross, the Lamb of God. And that's why when the curtain in the temple split, there would have been many, many people in the temple obtaining their lambs in order to offer the sacrifice. And so many people would have seen it. It would have been a shock to the priests who were preparing those sacrifices. <clears throat> the cross was then raised and dropped into the ground. So there would be a Roman soldier who would say, tole, which means raise up. And with ropes, they would raise the cross and then drop it into the ground so that it would stay there. And that caused, of course, our Lord a great deal more pain as they did that. And this was done at exactly 12 noon. And now let us look at the sufferings of Christ on the cross itself. We said, first of all, that he had to endure this disgraceful and shameful form of death. As a matter of fact, it was so shameful that we don't see the cross in the pre-Constantinian art. That is, in the first few centuries of Catholicism, we do not see in, the, in that ancient art the use of the cross because the Romans considered it something so shameful and it, it seems that the early church did not want to publicize to the Romans that fact that he died on the cross. They would, of course, said it to themselves and knew that and had a great veneration for the cross themselves. But it doesn't seem to be in the art for some reason. Just as they would not let the Romans know about the Mass or the Holy Eucharist, because then they would be accused, as they were, of eating the flesh of human beings. And they had to gradually tell the catechumens of the Holy Eucharist and the Mass 
uh, because if they gave them too much at first, they might be turned away. Now with the coming of Constantine, we see the cross everywhere because he was told to put that cross on his standards. The Romans considered the bodies of the crucified unworthy of burial. So they would just leave them on the crosses to be to rot. That was the common. But the Jews didn't like that because they had an abhorrence of blood and death. But it was, that was the Roman attitude. And uh, he was deprived of his garments, as we said, but he did have the long loincloth. Then he had to hear the blasphemies and the jeers of the Jews. The thieves, first, it says in one gospel that both of them were blaspheming him. But then later on, we hear that one converted and asked to be remembered in his kingdom. And our Lord gave him the beautiful words that today this, you will be with me in paradise. A man that had lived a, an absolutely depraved life is cured of that by a single act of contrition, a single act of charity, obviously under the influence of the grace of God. And we see that the Pharisees are wagging their heads. It's in the gospel. They had to be so giddy with joy that they're wagging their heads looking at this horror of the cross. Could you imagine? And the, he had to listen to the mocking of the chief priests. He saved others. Notice that they, they talk in front of him in third person so that he can hear. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him now deliver him if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Notice that they know exactly what his doctrine was. They were not confused at all. They said to Pilate, he made, he made himself equal to God. He has to die for that. We have a law. And that's what moved Pilate. But Pilate, we know, was not convinced by what they said because he put the inscription, King of the Jews, on the cross, even though they said, we have no king but Caesar. For Pilate knew that they were lying when they said that. And he knew that they were lying when they said, anyone who makes himself a king is against Caesar. That's simply not true. The Romans themselves set up Herod as king of the Jews. He was very tight with the Romans, having spent a long time in Rome. And they set him up. And there were many cases in which the Romans dealt with local kings and potentates, as long as they paid tribute to Caesar and to Rome. So Pilate knows that that is totally false. He knows they're lying. And that's why he put that inscription up. And even when they came to him and said, oh, you shouldn't say king of the Jews, but that he said he was king of the Jews. And he gave them that very strong response, what I have written, I have written. The Roman sword going right through their hearts. You listen to me and don't give me all of that nonsense. The soldiers split up his, his cloak. It's in today's gospel in four parts because there were four soldiers and that was typical. They had a right to it and they ripped it apart. 
Now the cloak was what went over our Lord's tunic. The tunic is something like an alb. It has sleeves and it goes to the floor. But there was a cloak that he wore that you commonly see on statues. And that they ripped up. But the tunic had no seams in it. Tradition says it was made by our Blessed Lady. And just as the clothing on the Jews grew as they grew in the desert, so also the, this tunic, originally made by our Blessed Lady, grew as he grew. That's tradition. And they saw that it had no seams. So they decided to throw dice for it. And then, however, they had to sell it. It was the law that they had to sell it to someone. And so someone bought our blessed Lord's tunic. <clears throat> and then we see that our Lord expressed a feeling of abandonment. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now you have to understand that that's Psalm 21, which is a messianic psalm referring specifically to the passion. If you read the whole psalm, it's, it's entirely his passion. It is prophetic of what will happen. So he is actually citing that psalm for himself. I am identifying with this prophecy. But he also wants to feel that part of death whereby we feel abandoned, that is helpless to do anything for ourselves, there is such a strong feeling in us to survive that as death approaches, there is a feeling of abandonment. And our blessed Lord wanted to taste death entirely. Not only the pains of death, the fear of death, but also all of the psychological pain of death. And so, you know, you might say, how could he say that? First of all, notice that he says, he doesn't say father, but he says my God. That means he's talking in his human nature, according to his human nature. Because if he were talking according to his divine nature, he would have said my father. So he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the theologians explained it in this way, that he did whatever he had to do in order to feel that abandonment. Just as in the Garden of Olives, he obviously knew that he would submit to the torture and death of the cross, but he wanted to feel the temptation not to do the will of God in order to show us what we must do, in order to feel our temptation. And he did whatever he had to do within his own person to accomplish that. Not my will, but thine be done. And so also he wanted to feel this aspect of death. <clears throat> so that is the suffering of Christ. Let us look at his obedience. St. Paul said, For as by the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, so also by the obedience of one many shall be made just. That is the key. The, Martin Luther said that the crucifixion was the outpouring of anger from God the Father upon his son because he was enraged by the sins of human beings. And that was our redemption. The idea being for Luther that the price is paid, we don't have to do anything else except believe in our redemption. But that is far, far from the truth. The truth is that our Lord offered himself as a pleasing sacrifice to his Father 
as an act of supreme love and that that act of love was so pleasing to God that it outweighed all of the displeasure of the sins of the human race. And as we see and contemplate the sins of the human race, we get an idea of the intensity of the love of God and the pleasure of God the Father to receive that sacrifice from his son. That is actually a more important aspect of what happens today, the sacrifice of love. So Christ's passion is not merely a payment for sin. It is true that it is, but it is not merely that. Just as we have through sin preferred our own will to God's will, so the will of man must be bent back. It must become obedient. That is the salvation of men. It is not merely to believe that the price has been paid. It is to bend back our wills and to become obedient. In the Old Testament, animals were offered bloody sacrifices all day long in the temple, which were accepted in the place of human sacrifice. But these sacrifices did not justify, they did not give us sanctifying grace. They were only symbolic. Likewise, the Jews of the Old Testament were subject to the Levitical law, that is, to the minute observances, which were very difficult to understand, why we had to avoid this or that, why we had to wash our hands because of this or that. But God imposed this on them in order they, that they learn to obey. Obey without question and obey with faith. God wills that we do these things. I don't understand it, but I must do it. That was their training in the Old Testament. St. Paul said to the Jews of Jerusalem, referring to the creation of the, excuse me, the cessation of the old law and its sacrifices. He said this, sacrifices and oblations and holocausts for sin, thou wouldst not. You don't want them, he says to God. Neither are they pleasing to thee, which are offered according to the law. Then said I, and he's speaking as if he is Christ here, said I, behold, I come to do thy will, O God. He continues, in which will we are sanctified by the oblation of the body of Jesus Christ once. This is the offering of himself. I have come to do thy will, O God. And we know that our blessed Lord was constantly referring to do the will of his Father. He said to the apostles, after he had converted the Samaritan woman, and they came back with food, for it says first that he was hungry. He refused the food and he said, my meat, meaning my food, is to do the will of my Father. He was so exhilarated, you might say, by the conversion of that one soul that he no longer wanted any temporal food. His food was to do the will of his Father. And we saw him in the agony of the garden, not my will, but thine be done. This was the purpose of his coming. Behold, I come to do thy will, O God. The original sin of Adam and Eve was a sin of disobedience, prideful disobedience. And this disobedience deprived Adam of sanctifying grace and the preternatural gifts. It also wounded his nature in such a way that it would have a proclivity to sin, as well as ignorance, especially about the things of God. And we have seen the human race act 
in a totally disgraceful manner since the beginning of time. It's a fallen race. And whereas all of the other animals do exactly what they're supposed to do, and all of the heavenly bodies go exactly where they're supposed to go, and there are laws which govern all of those things, laws of motion and gravity and centrifugal force, which govern everything, everything in order. Human beings are a complete wreck. They don't do what they should do. And they constantly commit sin. And they say stupid things and adhere to superstitions and idiotic thoughts. And as a result, they kill babies in their wombs and have no shame for it. That's the human race. Or they decide, if they're a man, to become a woman. And we're all supposed to applaud. That's the human race. It's sick. And that's the effect of original sin. This deprivation of grace is communicated to the children of Adam by natural generation, and it is called original sin. So the repair of this original sin had to be an act of obedience. The new head of the human race would be obedient. St. Paul, referring to Christ, said, Behold, I come to do thy will, O God, in, in, in the which will we are sanctified by the oblation of the body of Jesus Christ once. And he said, and we sing this over and over again during these three days, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross, for which cause God also hath exalted him and hath given him a name which is above all names, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those that are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father. Why? Because of his obedience. Obedience even unto death, even to the death of the cross. That is our salvation. Our salvation consists in obedience to the will of God. Our Lord said there are three things to do. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Denying yourself is the condition of obedience. You cannot obey unless you mortify yourself. Taking up your cross is your mortification. Every single day we must bear our crosses. And third, following him is to obey him, obey the commandments of God. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, he said. So obedience to the will of God and taking up our cross daily by the offering of our sufferings and trials in union with the cross of Christ and the holy sacrifice of the Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.